I'm Ann Zimmerman. I'm the Vice President of the Salina League of Women Voters. We are so glad you're all here. Lori Tro, our president, had a church meeting. She'll be coming late, but uh, she gives you her greetings and is sorry she can't get in on the first. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a not-for-profit, non-partisan organization. We, uh, as opposed to many other organizations, we do not support or oppose candidates uh, and we do encourage public participation, civic participation by everybody who's eligible and we work to get voters registered although there's some, uh, we have a pause on our voter registration and doing it ourselves in the last couple years because of a new law that means we could be considered felons if we, uh, if they think that we are a uh, what do you call it? An, an election official. If someone thinks we're an election official registering people to vote, we could be accused of a felony. And we don't want to be felons, uh, but we do want people to register to vote. So we do have lots of QR codes that send you to ksvotes.org. Uh, I'm guessing that every single person here is registered to vote, but uh, if you know anybody who isn't, they have until August some date. Does anyone know? October 13th. 13th of October to register for the November 7th election, which is the school board and the city commission up for election. So this is our fall issues forum. We have had fall issues forums for many years. Um, I think last year we moved it to spring uh, because of the August primary vote that was happening and uh, we uh, so we had our fall issues forum in the spring. But we're back to the fall this year, and glad to have you all here. We are having our speaker as Chief C.J. Wise. Uh, he began as our police chief last winter, I think in February, is that right? January. January, okay. And uh, he'll tell us about himself, and uh, we hope he'll tell us about his plans for policing in Salina. Chief Wise has 25 years of law enforcement experience in his home state of Oklahoma. He was a detective, a SWAT team member, a canine officer, a drug enforcement and internal investigations officer. He has a master's degree in criminal justice management and a bachelor's degree in business and organizational leadership. He is also a graduate of the FBI National Academy and he is also a member of the Native American Caddo Nation in Central Oklahoma. Please welcome Chief C.J. Wise. Thank you all very much for coming out. You know, it always impresses me that anyone wants to hear me talk, you know? So, it, and I say this all the time because like, my wife, she is tired of hearing me talk, you know? And so, you know, just tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm from Tecumseh, Oklahoma, a small little town, about 3,500 people, um, born and raised there, and I had another brother. He's four years older. And my parents always dreamed of us staying in a small town. And so that's what my mom wanted for us. Well, as we kind of got older, um, and to kind of back it up, so I, first I thought I was going to be a pro football player. I, I dreamed of it, and I thought, man. And then, uh, you know, the biggest look I ever got at college, Pennsylvania University, sent me some information, and I sent them some tapes, and then they came and talked to me, and they said, we thought you were taller than that. Because uh, the football coach uh, did, me, did me a favor, and on our, you know, stat sheet, he listed me at 6'2". So, you know, in, sh in shoes, I'm at, right at six foot. So, and like I said, when they came, they're like, eh, we expected someone a little bigger. So, you know, so that was kind of my dream initially. And then as it kind of went on, I kind of really thought, well, maybe that won't work out. So I thought, well, I'm going to be maybe going to athletic training because I'll be able to hang around sports and, you know, because... Luckily, the hospital I had, they had some athletic trainers assigned to us, and so I kind of, that was my interest. And so I was getting recruited to play football here at Kansas Wesleyan, and so I came. And whenever I came first, before I even saw the football game, um, we came and we met with the advisor, and they asked me what I was wanting to major in, and I told them. And so they sat down and they told me, they're like, how was your math and science grade? And I was like, yeah, it's, it's all right, you know. 
And they're like, if you're not just passionate about math, you're going to fail in science. And I was like, I mean, that was like a slap in the face. Cause, but I felt it because I was like, man, I kind of thought I could kind of eat through. Because like I've always said, how, how much science do I need to tape angles? But I guess a lot. So it really sent me thinking. Uh, when I left here, I never played football here. But I remember going back home going, well, that's not really what I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? And so, through some thinking and stuff, I decide on law enforcement. And so, it's funny that when years down the road, when this job came up and that brief interaction is what led me to even apply here. And so, it just, it's a God thing. And uh, so, I, it, I mean, me and my wife, we could sit here and tell you a whole testimony of how we wound up here. But then, kind of back it up. So, I got into, I first became a jailer in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And because that was my dream job. I thought, man, I want to work for Shawnee, Oklahoma. And if you don't know, it's like the next, it's the biggest town in the area where I'm from. And so I worked there for a little bit, and I thought, this is cool. I'm around law enforcement. But, you know, I'd listen to the radio. I'd be in the jail all night. And if you've ever known anybody that's worked in corrections or a jail, it's almost like being in jail yourself because you're, you're in there. You don't have any light. You, you're just sitting there. And so it, it's kind of rough, but I'd hear these officers get into all of this you know, pursuit, the foot chase, and then they would come and this guy that's all, you know, fired up and mad at law enforcement, they go, here you go, handle them. And so I decided, I like, man, I, I really do want to be an officer. So once I became 21, I applied and I, I got hired as an absentee Shawnee Travel Police Department. And I loved that job. It was, you know, I was making minimum wage, but it showed me that I love law enforcement. And I had little to no training, because the way, that like even applying here, I applied right after my first job. It took about six months through the whole hiring process. When I applied for the travel police, I applied on a Monday, I interviewed on a Tuesday, I started on a Wednesday. And so, um, small police department, and I learned a lot there. We were only about a 10 man department, but our uh, chief of police, he ran it like a big professional department. And so that's one thing I really learned about being professional, treating people professional, and even in our reports. But so, my first night, I'm riding with the sergeant, and they kind of laid out this training plan for me, and they tell me I'm going to ride, much like we do here, it's called the field training, I'm going to ride with, you know, a different officer each month and kind of learn how to do the job. And up to this point, I hadn't even shot a handgun before. So, I, because when they interviewed, they asked me if I was familiar with handguns, and I go, yeah, I, I mean, I thought I was, and I mean, they didn't ask the you. So, if, if you hire people, ask the right questions. Have you ever shot a handgun would have been the better question. <laughs> And so, um, my first night I'm riding with this sergeant, and we go on a domestic call. And as we get there, he, we're about to get there, he tells me, hey, uh, and he called me Pup. Hey, Pup, you just set the car, and I'm going to show you how it's done. And he said, I was like, okay. And so, he goes into this domestic call between two brothers, and he comes running out of the door and has the two brothers on his back fighting. And so, I run, and all I had to train at this time, I had, I wrestled in high school and I played football, so it was kind of a mix of some WWF and some football. <laughs> and so I went and I tackled him and took him to the ground, and he's screaming for help, and so we had some county officers come and help us. And they got there, we get him in custody, and so they're like, and he gets up and he goes, man, pup, that was amazing. He said, you're good to go. So after that night, I rode by myself. And so, it was, you know, there's so many things I did that I probably should have been killed because I would go on burglaries by myself and because I just didn't know anybody. But also, it, it, like I said, it made me really love the job. It really made me love to help people. And also working with Native Americans, I really enjoyed that because you, you know, at times people would go, oh, you're a sellout. You know, you're, you know, you're one of us, but you're arresting us. And so it was, it was kind of an interesting dynamic to kind of set and deal with that. But I was there for about six months, and then I got hired by Edmond, Oklahoma, which is, if you know, it's just the north side of Oklahoma City. It's got about 100,000 people. When I first started there, there were probably maybe 60-something thousand people. And so, and it's about 100 square miles. And so it, it's a pretty good-sized town. And so while I was there, I was able to do quite a bit of everything. Um, I, I was a patrolman on all the shifts. I was a field training officer. Um, I was a canine officer, uh, and then I was a detective. And when I was a detective, um, I only worked narcotics mainly. And how that all worked out is we had a career enhancement uh, where you could go and uh, laterally go 
to this position and work. And so I knew nothing about narcotics, but I was just going around to everybody at the police department going, hey, do you know anybody dealing drugs? And so this one guy said, you know what's funny? He said, my parents said that the neighbors across the street are always in and out all hours of the night and everything, and they think they're dealing drugs. And so I go, all right, I'll get on. And so while I was out there for this month on career enhancement, we did this uh, technique called, it's called a trash pool, where the people are throwing away the trash and there's a bunch of drugs in there. So we got a warrant, and when we go in to serve the warrant, there's a bunch of college kids. And so they, you know, when you work in narcotics, you're always trying to get to their sources, their dealers. And so they made a, a, a purchase, and they, the guy came and delivered uh, drugs to, in front of us and sold to us. We arrested him. And the guy, he pulled up in a brand new Corvette. It was like the, I think, 50th anniversary edition. And so in Oklahoma, you can, you know, he used it to transport the drugs and it's paid off, so we seized it. So that happened, and then years later, when I promoted to detective, they're like, man, you know a lot about narcotics, which I didn't. They go, do you want to go to the Drug Enforcement Administration as, you know, a task force officer? And I was like, yeah, sure. So that little brief deal let me get to this point uh, with the DEA. And that was, I spent four years there, and it was amazing. We worked cases, you know, that dealt with the cartel and big cases. And, you know, we would travel all across the country. There would be times when they always told me, like, you know, always keep a bag packed in the car because you never know where you're going to wind up the next day. And I was like, yeah, sure. I was used to, like, in town working narcotics. And there would be days where Oklahoma City, we would start following a suspect. Okay, we're driving, all right, we're, we're in Texas now, you know. We're staying in Texas for them, and we're watching them, and you're like, man, I should have packed a bag, you know. And so, kind of learned that kind of fast. But that was, and I've met some amazing people. Um, and two, I met a supervisor there in that position who openly talked about God. And because prior to that, in law enforcement, I don't know if it's the ego or what it is, you don't have a lot of people that don't want to talk about God. And so this supervisor did. And so me, it, it, that really helped me start to talk more about my faith. And so that was a super experience. And then from that, I got promoted and I was a sergeant. And uh, I was a sergeant for about six years. And I was, you know, so I got on our SWAT team back in uh, 2001. And so I was there for a while. Actually, I was on it. And then I was over, the, the commander over it up until the time I got it here and so I was a sergeant and then I was a lieutenant and then I was a captain and then I was a major and as a major I was over our uh, internal affairs and I was over our criminal investigations and also our patrol division prior to coming here and, and to back up too I got so I've got six kids um, and a lot of people they go oh you're, ca you're Catholic is if people they always assume that and I'm, I'm like no I'm, I'm not my wife is you know so <laughs> And, uh, and, and true story, so my wife, so she was born and raised Catholic, and I, I wasn't, I was born and raised Baptist, and when we met, I was going to a non-denominational church, and so we discussed it, and you know, I'd go to church with her, and she goes, I, I can tell you don't get as much out of my church as, you know, so she would, whenever we were in Oklahoma, she would get her boys up, and uh, at 7.30 in the morning, go 7.30 Mass, come get me and then we go to what we call our home church. Well, then I feel like if I brought her all the way here, I've got to, you know, she's definitely going to do the same thing. So we go to Catholic church. So if you see us out and about, the Wise family is going to church twice because we're that bad. So, um, <laughs> But I've always openly told people if I make it to heaven, it's because I know Jesus and my wife. Because she is just a saint. You know. I have two older daughters and they're, they're full grown. They have kids of their own. And I'm just that weird, unorthodox family. And then so, uh, and I'm remarried, so with my wife, we've got four boys. We've got a nine, seven, five, and a two-year-old. And so the two-year-old was that amazing blessing that God gave us that we didn't know we needed. And it was, it was a shock. It was one of those days where my wife, you know, because we thought we were done after. If you ever had our third kid, you'd go, yeah, you should have stopped. So um, he, he was... Um, he has a handful. And so we had decided, no, we're good, we're done. And then this one day, my wife calls me. She goes, I had a weird feeling. Like I did, you know, when I was praying, I was like, whatever. And then, lo and behold, you know. And so, and this, you know, we wouldn't trade it for the world. But, man, that, and so people go, oh, man, they keep you down. I said, they keep you working, for sure. You know? And so, uh, and so, you know, actually, when I interviewed here, 
I told him, I said, I, if I get this job, I, I'm going to increase your population by six, you know. And so, uh, you know, but you know, and so far we have really enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, because I know people are like, well, it's a smaller town. <laughs> yeah. Than what you're used to. And, but you know, growing up where I grew up, and you know, it, this, it, it feel, it, I like the home feel to it, the town, and I like the interaction like this. I think more people know I'm a cop here than ever did where I was from. Um, even the neighbors, my wife has made friends with our neighbors and stuff, and, and some of that's on us too, where we, you know, we didn't, you know, reach out or to our neighbors, but around our neighbors now, we, you know, a lot more people are just seem friendly, and so we really appreciate that. My kids are enjoying school, and so fast forward. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but fast forward. So as I, I never intended to be a chief until, you know, poor leadership in the wrong positions. It can only take one or two people to to really run an organization. Where I come from, um, I had four chiefs, and two good ones and two not really good ones. And that it was really during the leadership of 2020 that really started maybe giving me a passion to be, uh, a, to lead an organization. One of the things in 2019, which was a great experience for me, was so I went to the FBI National Academy. It's a 10 week long school and you uh, stay there, you go to Quantico, Virginia. It's almost like top college. You enroll in uh, police classes, you take classes, you. You take, you can have gym and all that kind of stuff, and you get to go see all the sites. And so they say you will get a roommate. And so it's like, if you ever know, so you've got two to a room, you need a shared bathroom with two more people on the other side. And so the first day of this, you have to check in by five o'clock on a Sunday. So I'm there, nobody, and they said, if you don't have a roommate, you got lucky. And so I didn't want a roommate. I was like, 10 weeks, I, I want to have my own room. So seven o'clock rolls on, eight o'clock. I had no roommate. So I start putting my stuff on his side of the room. I call my wife, this is gonna be amazing, you know, and this is all so midnight I get a knock. And so it's one of the counselors and they come in and they're like, Hey, your roommate just got here and he's from Afghanistan. And I'm like, What? <laughs> and so I call my wife the next morning and I go, God, not only did I get a roommate, but he's from Afghanistan. What are we gonna have in common? You know, I didn't want a roommate from Arkansas, much like that. <laughs> and so, I, and, and seriously, you know, and so I was like, well, there's, a, we're, there's no commonality with this. And so the next night they had a, if you had an international roommate, you got to have a, uh, it was like a dinner. They had all the high ups of the FBI there and you'd go and sit with you. And this guy's 6'5". And I mean, he, it, he and so he, he comes in, I almost didn't even go to that. I was like, I don't even know this guy. And I'm going to go eat dinner with him. So I went, and they all, all the international students, they went around the room talking about, tell us something about your country. And everybody was like very lame stuff. Like, I'm from Belgium, we have the best beer. I'm from Germany, we have the best beer. And the guy's getting old. Well, the, my roommate, his name's Colin, he gets up and he tells kind of a little off color, dirty joke. And you're like, it is real subtle. And but everybody, like all the officers were dying laughing. All the high ups of the FBI were kind of like, oh my gosh. And I was like, man, this guy's all right, you know? <laughs> and so uh, the next night, you know, I'd, I'd driven a car out there. And so I go, hey, I'm going into town to Walmart. You want to go? And so he goes, yeah, sure. And so as we're going, I, I told him, I said, man, I said, I don't know anything about you. And I said, I've got a lot of assumptions and it's my ignorance. I go, I assume you probably don't like me because I'm American. We've been in your country a long time. And you're probably Muslim and I'm Christian. And you know, he had, so he's a translator for the military. And so he's like, I had grown to like and appreciate the Western culture. And he goes, no, he goes, we had no infrastructure until y'all came into our country. So I, I fully appreciate your, where you're from. And then he goes, and then the religion part, he goes, ah, he goes, you know, we believe a lot of the same stuff. And he kind of goes, it's not that big a deal. And I was like, yeah, it probably is, but whatever, you know. And so. But we became best friends, and even to the point where he rode back with me home, and he came and stayed a week with me and my family, and he now lives, so when Afghanistan fell, he barely got out, because he was high up, so he was like their version of the CIA, he was like high up in their, well they made it out, they first made it, and they got put in Fort Worth, Texas, we went and visited him, so now he's in Nebraska, and so, um, 
then my kids call him Uncle Collett. He comes to see us. He's actually came by and visited me here. And I, I was like, hey, you want a job? And he's like, no. Nah. He's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's totally, he goes, your, your laws are a lot different than what I was used to. And so, uh, but that was a, one of the biggest things that I didn't realize at the time. I mean, I made a great friend out of it. But that showed me that we are all way more alike than we are different. And so that helped me leading into 2020. So when 2020 happened, you know, for a brief second, it felt like society turned their back on law enforcement. You know, it, it did. And I kind of let myself kind of go into that mode where I felt that too. But then I'm like, you know what? We've got to do a better job as law enforcement. And I mean everywhere. And because, you know, we've always been... Some of it's our training, we're kind of standoffish, kind of, you know, you know, comment type stuff, and almost probably robotic when we come. And so I was like, we need to be more of engaging our community, let them see who we are, be more transparent. And so that really started to kind of plant a seed in myself. And then so as 2020 started going on, it wasn't my job, because I was over our patrol division, and we had people that did community outreach. But I felt the need to do more of that. And I found other people like-minded because not, not all officers are built that way. You know, there's different officers that, you know, like I always give the analogy of we've got officers that are very tactically sound. If someone's breaking into your house, you want this officer to come to your house because they will get there safely, they will protect you. But they're usually not the ones necessarily that is going to read a book to a second grader because they're just not that personality. You know, we're all made different. But I felt a real need to make some real um, relationships with the community. Because I've worked for agency where sometimes it's just a dog and pony show. And that's one of the things that I don't, I, people can see when it's real, when it's not, when it's fake. And so that was one of the things I was like, we gotta do a better job. And so that kind of started the, man, maybe I could do a better job as far as if I had the chance to, you know, because when you're not at the top, it, your ideas only go so far. And so that's where I kind of started talking to my wife. And one of the things she told me was, she goes, I'll move with you wherever, but do it while the kids are young. Don't wait until, you know, they're in high school. She goes, that would be way harder. And so I was like, okay. And then so, like I said, as I kind of started last year, opening up jobs, and there's jobs everywhere for chiefs of police, you know. And in Oklahoma, there's not any, because where I, I wanted to, so anything 50 officers or more to like 499 is considered a mid-sized apartment. And that's about the same the, the size apartment I wanted. And so I saw Salina. And it first stuck out because I've, I've been, been here once before. And like I said, I felt like I knew the place. And in all reality, I didn't. And so, but it kept leading. And you know, in the meantime, I, there's another place in Oklahoma I'd apply. And that place actually would have been closer to my mom, my mom, who we're still very close to, but it just didn't feel right. There was something about Salina that felt right, you know. When I even on Facebook looking at different, you know, because for a long time I was just stalking the PD, going, "Okay, does this look like a good fit for me?" And you know, just like anything, and then so fast forward, I get hired, and so there's issues, you know, there's issues, you know, with retention and stuff. But a lot of it, what I, in my experience of law enforcement. It's you. You got to treat people right. You know, you got to treat internally right. I can't expect officers to come out and treat citizens right if I'm not treating them right. And so that's one of the biggest things. And I had a mentor a long time ago told me, you know, as you learn and grow, you know, pay attention to the good stuff you see, but just important, don't become the bad stuff you see. And so that really stuck with me because there's a lot of stuff and I, I work hard not to forget where I came from, you know, as far as working those midnight shifts and being fair, you know. And so that's one of the things that as I became chief, I wanted to make it clear that's what, you know, we're going to treat people right internally because we want you to treat people right externally. You know, we want to be professional in what we do, you know, nothing less than first class. And we're going to make mistakes. You know, we're all a bunch of humans. You know, I, I make mistakes every day. And so... But I think too, I'm, I want to be open to uh, opinions and ideas. Our officers and our supervisors, they're our subject matter experts, you know. They have answered more salina calls than I ever will. And so I would be stupid not to listen to them, you know. And so, you know, and also, like I said, we, 
there was a passion with a lot of our officers to do the community engagement. Because when we have things come up, people jump on it and want to do it. And so that's what makes me excited for where we're going in the future. And we got a bunch of promotions that are I just opened up. We're about to like our whole command staff is re, is changing. And so for me, that's exciting because we're able to get you know new leaders in and stuff and get going in the right direction. And sometimes things I wish it would do a 180 like that, but it's but but I feel like we're going in the right direction for sure. Let me open up for any questions. Sure. Question? Could you tell me what your definition of a good chief is? You said you had two good chiefs and two bad. You know, there's so the bad ones is because one of the biggest killers of any police organization, and probably any deal, is ego and jealousy. Is where where I've seen that. And so, I, you know, there's days when I hear people, hey, Chief, hey, Chief, it still sounds odd to me, you know, because I, at times, you're like, and I, and I do, people ask me, hey, what should I call you? I call me CJ, you know, and so I go, because that title means nothing outside of our four walls of the day. And so I think, too, trying to be humble is very important. And I think that if you can be humble, you're going to realize that you're not threatened by when people go, hey, because I told people, don't let me run off a cliff. Tell me the truth. I don't want people blowing smoke. And so I think that's one of the biggest things in, in that servant leadership. One of the first supervisor schools I ever went to, they, they said early on, they're like, your days of glory are over. You're, you're getting titles, plaques are over. And so that's really stuck with me to where, you know, all the glory goes to the officers and everything. So I think that's one of the biggest things is being humble. But more than anything, treat people right, you know. I do some work with juvenile offenders, and we had one victim of a property crime telling me that the crime rate in Salina is worse in the state and worse than New York City and worse than Phoenix, Arizona. And I didn't have anything to say for that. Do you have any idea about crime statistics in Salina? I don't have any right off the top. To, um, there are, you know, and I think that's it. Perspective, you know, because yeah, no, we're not the worst in New York City, and I, I think we're actually, and I'm just saying, anecdotally, it feels like it's probably it's dropped some, I would think, just because some. I mean, yeah, and I think nationally the trend, even where I came from, was a traditionally low crime rate area, and but over the years, because when I was a brand new officer, any shootings or anything, they were so few and far between. But then, like, as I was leaving, that was kind of a common thing. Like, you have a shooting, a robbery, where used to, when I was brand new, you might have one every, maybe once a year, but it was, it's more common. But I don't have any like, numbers just by my hand to, to get you. So you're asking what is it, or like the shift of attitudes, are they kind of shifting to kind of go along with what I'm trying to... Yeah, what's been their response to your different, perhaps your different way of, right. of teaching and approaching? I think on the most part, very positive. Um, on the most part, a lot of people I think were eager for the change and to see something different. And, you know, just like in any organization, um, there's probably some people that go, oh, I, I like the old way, you know. But, you know, I think, I, I never expected 100%, but I think over time, you go, well, everybody else is going this way, so we're all going this way. But even the supervisors, you know, they are picking up on what I'm wanting and what, like, my goal and vision. And so as they instruct officers and what they're doing, I can hear it, you know, they'll almost, you know, recite it back to me going, hey, I know this is what you're wanting, and so this is what we're trying to get officers to do. But on the most part, I think people were ready for some type of change. The police review board is fairly new, and have you ever worked with one, and what's your perception of how they're doing? Yeah, it's, I had never, yeah. so you're asking how the uh, police review board is, and like my interaction, and I had never worked with one before, 
Because, you know, and that's one of the things that also really caught my eye about Salina, to have that, because that, I'm sure, came about in 2020, which a lot of different towns that got proposed or whatever, and I saw a lot of police departments fight that tooth and nail. Because, you know, it goes back to the, oh, I don't want you looking into what I've got going, and I'll tell you what you need to know type stuff. And so, I think, though, I, I like it, because I think if you do stuff right, you don't have to worry about it, you know. And so, you don't mind going, hey, this is what we had, here you go. And so, I like that transparency, and so I, I think they're doing a good job, you know, because so... Like last year, they had we had three cases, so they review um, use of force complaints for bias based police, and they had three, and so they took a look at those. You know, we do our internal investigation, and then they go and present it to them, and they vote if they see it the same way as we did. And so I, I think it's very beneficial, and I think too, it opens up some of that trust with the public. So I think it's a good thing. Okay. The, uh the fire department downtown office just completely went by. You barely glanced at it. Does yeah. it bother you a little bit that you'd like to know what's going on? <laughs> you know, a, a little bit. But, you know, it's funny. It's I think if I was when I was a brand new officer, I would have been on my phone. Hey, what's going on? The and the longer I get to, I trust our people, and I know they're going to handle it. And so. The only time that there's those midnight calls every now and I get a call and I, so I get prepared and I'm like, oh, here's the big one. What it is. And usually it's just, hey, we had this, everybody's fine. I'm like, okay. That's so I think too, a little bit of maturity. I've gotten to where I don't get all excited about that stuff where I've, I just know it's going to be handled and if they need me, they'll call me. That's what we were waiting for too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how I know it, it, it's right now is not that big a thing. My phone isn't vibrated or nothing. Okay. Uh, I lived in Salina about 20 years now, and so I'm still something of a stranger. Uh, and I think that's true in many communities. But as I walk through different parts of Salina, and I, of course, find myself where I, I live primarily. But as I go to different areas of Salina, it strikes me that there are different communities almost visible besides just the housing itself. Do you have any observations about different communities in Salina? interaction with them, observations about them as a police officer. You know, so he's asking me about different interactions with the different communities in Salina. And one of the things, too, is for us as law enforcement, we want to get into all the communities, but we have to have, like, somebody to kind of bridge for us. Because if I come in and just like, hey, we just want to come and do this thing, people are like, whoa, we're here. And so one of the great things, and uh, if, you, if you know Cash Hollister, and so we, me and him sat down, and this was actually the first time I came here, and we met here for coffee. And he didn't drink coffee, though, at least at the time he didn't. And so, but we, so I still like him, though. But, uh, so, and so we were talking, and you know, we were just talking about, because I was interested in his music, his faith, and we got to talk about policing and kind of my philosophy and stuff. And he asked me, he goes, what have y'all ever done for the black community? And I said, nothing that I know of. I was like, do you have a way in? And so, you know, over the 4th of July weekend, he had, a, it was a North End block party. He invited us to, we went, and it was very successful. And we plan on, we're going to be there again next year. Well, then just two weeks ago, we had a, a, an open forum for the Hispanic community. And that went very well. And I mean, because, you know, especially the Hispanic community, there's the aspects of, um, you know, your immigration status that they're scared of us. And that's one of the things we reassure them that, you know, I care more about your safety than about your immigration status. And we're not INS, you know. And so we had a good interaction, but those are the things we're wanting to do more and more of. But please, if you have connections to any of these communities, reach out to us and we are more than willing to come and be a part of that. But we do have to have some kind of, because, you know, we just can't bully our way into anything like that. Trying to resolve whatever. 
basically you're asking like like what, someone's making a complaint on an interaction with an officer. It depends on the different levels. You know, if someone calls in and says, I was had a traffic stop, an officer was rude, a lot of times the that officer's supervisor will take a look at that and they will you know, it's kind of a smaller but if it's a more serious, like oh they um, they use force on me when they shouldn't or something like that, we have an internal affairs investigator that looks into that and runs that investigation. But every complaint we get, because sometimes we, I just had one today where someone goes, I'm not wanting to make a complaint, but I just want to let you know, I thought your officer was rude. And so, gave that to the supervisor, supervisor, we went ahead and looked into it like we would anything else, reviewed the video, saw some things that we were right on, some things that we needed to correct. And so we addressed it that way. But everything gets looked into. Uh, excuse me, Mike, again. Uh, you just mentioned videos. Are do, you, do the officers run their personal videos all the time here in our community or not? As far as to say all the time, no. I mean, they're responsible for, like, if an officer right now is driving around the car, it's not running. But if they get out on a call, they're, they're supposed to switch it on. And so, very few times. And it may happen every now and then, but because usually there's more than one officer going to the call, so we're catching video where the ball isn't, you know, there's something going on. But it's up to the officer to, to turn on the camera. SCI, or the downtown district, has like 34, 36 cameras that are apparently running all the time, and they're only reviewed if there's some incident research. Is the police department work directly with that, or? Yeah, we, well, we have to request to get the access, and you're right. Like, if we have an incident go on, we'll go, hey, can we get, you know, September 10th, this day, can we come look at that? And they'll allow us to do that. But, yeah, so we, we're we aware of the cameras and stuff, and uh, we use them for anything that happens in those areas. I have a recollection that the, I believe the police department was trying to recruit a social worker to work. Right. on de-escalating yes. things I'm, and I know that's a real tough, tough hiring environment I just wanted to know where the department was set at on that project yeah so we had you know they were working with the county we got two um, co-responders we, we have one right now and she's you know just kind of in the initial stages of getting that going and everything and they're still working to try to find us the second one and I think it's for them hiring is just like anybody else and, and two that's enough of it to, it's a brand new position I think some of this is what we've been told are kind of holding back to see how this first position goes and like the guinea pig go and then they go okay yeah I, I might be interested so yeah it's you know it's a great tool for us to have and you know because the whole mental health aspect law enforcement never wanted any of that you know and I think people kind of mistakenly go, because I've had people tell me that, going, man, you know, y'all being involved in this mental health game is not, this isn't a good fit. Like, we never wanted it, you know? And, but it got dumped on law enforcement, you know? And so we're trying to do the best we can, you know? But at the end of the day, we're not mental health people. You know, we're working on getting a lot more of our officers, you know, CIT trained, which to deal with, you know, people going through a mental health crisis. But still, there's better avenues, you know, and we're there more for the safety aspect. But hopefully, you know, as this keeps growing, and, and we're, we're having a lot of positives of uh, interaction with um, having our co-responder, and she's able to help us out a lot. Because there's a lot of stuff that just because, you know, and some people mistakenly, just because you have a mental health crisis or, you know, that didn't mean it's not against the law, you know. And so a lot of people forget that. And so, that's where that co-respond, that's all, that's her alley. That's her wheelhouse. And like I said, we really have nothing in, too, we can escalate stuff just because from me showing up. So it's a lot better to have someone in plain clothes there that can do all the talking and they're trained for that too. So yeah, it's coming along, but hopefully by this time next year we'll have them both up and running. Where does, where does that individual get trained at? So she, you know, we had uh, this level, she's a the licensed mental health, and so she had that prior to even coming to us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what uh, Central Kansas Mental Health, that's what they're, they're trying to get them trained before they actually come to us. And we kind of talked about, do we, you know, get the, like the social work aspect of it, do we, because it was a grant, and make sure we're meeting that wording 
because it, because it, it possibly open up the pool of applicants. So we're trying to tweak that to get the right fit. In addition to the mental health issues, what about uh, the drugs and alcohol issues? Right. Addiction issues. Yeah. That and, you know, a disease process. Oh. Mm -hmm. And CKF, you know, they work pretty closely together. And that's kind of one of the things that's a, that's an avenue that we we try to take people down that, that road to get them involved in that, you know. And I know they're working on getting a mental health court, you know, which I think that would be really great. Where I came from in Oklahoma, they had that. So there would be times where we may have someone going through a mental health episode and they committed a crime. Well, rather than to send them to the normal charging, you could send them to the mental health court aspect where, you know, their treatment and everything is kind of tied to what their sentence is, so to speak. And I saw more positives, way more positive coming out that way than coming out this other way. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Um, I have not have a cop kept up with this, but how is the university hiring going? Last time I knew anything about anything about the police in the salon, that was an issue as far as... Well, hiring, period, is an issue. You know, it's, and I didn't realize it's the location is where, so you know, you go too far east, you know, you got the agencies, you know, uh, Lawrence, all them, you got people down there, south Wichita, and so there's kind of, you know, we can get to the north and the west, so that's a, kind of a tricky thing. You know, we're setting at about what I, I'm very proud of, and this is something that the PD had in place before I got here, but they have, we got about 19% female, which that's, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah, our goal is, because we joined a 30 for 30 initiative um, a couple of years ago, and it's the goal of it is to get 30% female by the year 2004. And so that's, that's one goal. And we've got, I think we're setting at, um, demographic-wise, our, where there's uh, representation that equals about, but we can always do better. And so, you know, some of the things we've tried is, because we're trying to think outside the box, you know. You know, we usually have luck at Kansas Wesleyan, we have luck at um, Fort Riley and stuff, but we're trying to reach out to different places to, you know, broaden up, you know, we went to Haskell uh, Indian University uh, last year, and we're going back, to, and we're in the initial stages of building, that kind of the same thing about building the community, you know. We went to their graduation, and we didn't set up this big recruiting thing because I didn't, the first time we're there, I, I wanted to, hey, let's start working. So we're working with their recruiters to, you know, invite us back and stuff like that. So we're trying what we can, you know, as far as to, to think outside the box and to hopefully get, and, you know, and that's thing, we're just looking for the best qualified. And so we'll, but I think that's one of the things. And so one thing, so we have six Spanish speakers. Um, and so that, that impressed me. And because where I came from, we had one, and we had 126 officers. And so, you know, here, we're a lot of 84 officers, and we're setting about 68 right now, 67, 68. And so, percentage-wise, that's pretty good. Yeah. Six officers? Six, six officers? Yes. 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 Oh, no. So, not just translate. Oh, no, no, they're Spanish speakers. They, they're more of the, you know, because where I came from, um, the one Spanish speaker we had was like a textbook Spanish speaker. Where like yeah, it was very choppy and very brutal to listen to, and so you know when we had this uh, outreach, we I was listening to some of our officers uh, communicate. I was like, wow, that's impressive. You know, I mean, I didn't know what they were saying, but it sounded really good. <laughs> <laughs> the guys are cool. They do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what's your department's role in uh, working with the community to work on the homelessness issue? Yeah. You know, so that's. And that's another thing where I think a lot of people can get misled and they think it's a police issue, you know. And so and there's aspects like if you break the law, we, we're going to go and enforce it. But also there's, there's a much bigger aspect because usually the homeless, in the way I've, you know, any that I've interacted with, there's always uh, maybe a, an addiction going on or and or um, mental health. And so there's you can't arrest your way out of that, you know? And so I think some people will think, you know, like our norms were, if I get arrested, oh, I'm gonna lose my job, oh, the embarrassment, 
Well, that doesn't necessarily apply when you're struggling with all these other issues. And so we are part of it, and we are over meeting regularly with the community. But it's it's a bigger issue, than, and it's something that we need to talk through and stuff. And it's one of those deals where I think the, the models that are kind of working, if you look at all other places, mm -hmm. is helping them get some type of housing, and that that's what works. Us arresting them, yeah, you know, that's what I tell people. Work. Even if we wouldn't arrested them every day, they're going to be right back out. So it's just a that's a band aid, you know. And so, um, like I said, we, we will address those issues where the law is being broken. But the homelessness issue is really not a police issue. And I'm glad you raised it as a homelessness issue mm -hmm. rather than homeless people. Right. Because that was just brought up yesterday in a group I was in, and I thought that was a good distinction. Mm -hmm. The meeting that the city had in January, I don't know if you were here yet or not. I wasn't. It was pretty much, okay, we're going to talk about all the problems that the homeless people have not looking at the systemic issues that cause homelessness. And so it's not my it's not my brainchild, but I think that's a good way to look at it is, is distinguishing those two things. Right. And you know it's uh, and it's such a big issue, but it's an issue that us as a community we gotta sit down and talk about. And like I said, we've got a part in it, but it's a way smaller part than people think. Mm -hmm. I mean because people think, oh we can stack charges and lock them away forever and I was like man some of the major drug dealers aren't getting locked away forever and so and so and two the way we enforce stuff we can't go after people because of their living status you know I mean I told people we can violate their rights it's just like I couldn't your rights and so we have to make sure we're doing everything by board but that you're you're right that's where the the fix is and I'm not in I don't know if we'll get to it in my lifetime, but it's worth talking about, and it's worth us really getting beyond talking about, but let's do something about it. And, you know, you may strike out a few times with some people because of that mental health aspect. You know, as I was an officer coming up, we had different people that were passionate about working with mental health. I, I wasn't, and it was only because, man, it was like building a house of cards. You know, I'd see these officers work, they'd get people, you know, housing, get them a job, and then something sets them off, you know, where they get off their medications and they go back to ground zero. And I was like, God, oh, that would just be deflating. And so I think going into it as we develop whatever we get, we got to know there's going to be some times we, we're going to fail, but there's going to be some people we're going to help, you know. And so it's just worth it to, but like I said, I think that, and I appreciate you bringing that up because it is a bigger topic than just us. I think a lot of people, though, think it's just a police issue and it's not. Good to see you. Uh, you know, I really appreciate that you bring empathy and compassion to this job. Yeah, thank you. Really, really, really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you in, in that one, uh, I want to ask you this question <laughs> as it relates to that one. Uh, we see that the county has opened up a new jail and they're having a knife uh, and slammer, which I think is meant to be kind of lighthearted, but in, in a lot of our opinions, there's nothing like hard about going to jail. Right. And losing your liberty. So my question for you is that what would maybe be some non-negotiables for you as far as the use of force and how you train the officers that this is where the line is. And so what what are maybe an, an example of your experience that you, 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 you know, could you repeat the question again? I'll try. <laughs> so basically, he, he was asking the non-negotiables for me, like the use of force and stuff like that. You know, there's there's a willful, you know, and then there's like, okay, if I use force, because, you know, an excessive use of force is anything. Once someone's in custody, and this is just boiling it down to simple, and then you keep applying force, whatever it may be. And it could be anything from, okay, I got the guy... And just because you're in handcuffs doesn't mean you're technically under control. But say I've got someone under control and I shove them. To me, that's excessive use of force. You know, and it's on the scale of it, it's a little down here, but we're going to address it. There, I mean, there's no, oh, yeah, hey, man, don't get, no, that, that's serious. Anytime you do that, that is serious. To, like, a, especially when you start striking somebody and it's not needed, that, you know, depending, you know, it, it's hard for facts and the details that go into a lot into the, the story. But 
you know, if you're striking somebody and they're, you know, they are in custody, that's that's a non-negotiable. You know, if it's like you, like I'm with punching somebody or something like that, um, somebody that, you know, kind of not exactly on this, but that lies about it. You know, I where I came from, I've seen this where. You know, someone was taken in custody, uh, he was fighting, I hit him once. You watch body camera, I hit, you hit him four times. To me, that's non-negotiable, you know, and that's, there's, you just, there's no wiggle with it. You know, I mean, you're, you've perjured yourself, but also you probably did it to cover up these extra use of the forces, that which were excessive. Does that kind of answer? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What kind of consequences, do, I'm sure, to being fired, would officers or do officers have? Mm -hmm. So depending on the severity of it, you know, we've got our, you've got our discipline scales, anything from counseling to like a, a reprimand to up to days off. Like me, as a department head, I can give a week off without pay. Um, anything more than that, I can send it to the city manager and ask for, hey, I'd like 20 days for this officer without pay. And so but he has to approve anything more than a week's worth of for more than 40 hours. So it ranges anywhere from, depending on what happens, from something minor to something, you know, short of you know, losing your job to several days off without pay. Um, I am not really up to date on this issue, but I'm thinking about juveniles and how when our juveniles, juveniles are detained, they are sent out of town, yes. uh, which really takes them away from their family support. I, I understand that the juvenile facility we had was just not it. Right. I came from a community that had a much better facility than that. But, uh, and I think our diversion programs have helped us in that realm. We probably try not to put children in detention. But uh, do you have any fresh ideas about that situation? Yeah, I think, you know, what I really like about here, too, is the community corrections. Is because I'm not used to that where I come from. It's usually the only time you get on any type of, what I would say, probation is once you get ran through the system. So community, I like that aspect, and I think if we could do that more for like juveniles, but let's, before you get in the system, let's try to, let's try everything we can, because you're right, I think you can look at any statistic, and once you put a juvenile in the system, their odds go way up for being there later on. And I think that's the time we need to definitely try to do some type of diversion. And that's another one of those things where it's even incarceration in general. Big topic, but we need to start talking about that kind of stuff, too, because what we're doing is probably not the best. I guess I'll say two things. First of all, I want to speak up for the Salina Initiative for Restorative Justice, which does just that. It's the cases from community corrections for juvenile offenders, and it makes them sit across from their victims and work out something to make things right. Uh, but I also want to ask you about, you have like two degrees in organizational management. Was that, did you start thinking about being a chief and then go out to learn that, or how did you end up in those no, fields? No, it just, uh, you know, my first degree, because I'd always used to hear, hear, it was like, don't get in criminal justice, because it'll be worthless <laughs> if you get out of law enforcement. But I did that, because I, and it's funny, whenever I took the management side for criminal justice for my master's, the books were almost identical. It's all talking about leadership management and stuff. But, you know, kind of going back to treating the people right, you know, one of the things, though, is you used to, they used to talk about the, the dictator leadership. And, you know, they don't talk about that in books anymore because that doesn't work, you know. But unfortunately, a lot of law enforcement is still stuck in that, you know. And so, no, I never had intentions like that. I think it's, which I think it's probably, I have seen people early in their career go, I'm going to be chief of police. And sometimes I think if you do that, you're, you're skipping rungs on the ladder. There's, you need to spend time at each rung, and I have worked with people that skipped too many rungs, and they really didn't know how to do the job down here. And so I would never wanted to be that person, so I guess I never really thought about it until it kind of hit me, and I was like, I, I've got the qualifications, I can go and do it. So it, I, like, once again, it's a God thing. It just worked out, you know, where I look back at my life, even meeting my roommate from Afghanistan, that was a big point of change in me. And so, uh, like I said, every little piece has been a cog that 
คุณมีด้วยค่ะ I was wondering about um, reviews and histories of officers that come into the police department. You know, we heard stories of people that have been shifted from one department to another. They right. got horrible records in that other department. How do they end up being rehired? Right. How do you handle that? You know, we do our background check because we've had people that just since I've been here, you know, looks great, but then when they start look, you start looking into their background, um, things are they're running from something or something's going on, and so our background investigators really done a good job of weeding those people out. And so, yeah, we you know, and two, they they sit through a panel interview, and so they got to answer questions about, hey, why are you coming from here? Why you know? And then, of course, it's easy to, you know, especially around here, you know, everybody knows somebody. Because a lot of times, <laughs> you know, and so somebody will go, yeah, somebody will go, oh, that's easy. I know somebody down there and Hutchison, I'll call them. And so it, it all, it, it works out. And so, like I said, it, we, because of that, we have out people that they apply and they look good up until that point. And so, and I think sometimes, you know, I think, and that's one thing we have talked about is, we're not going to lower our standards, even though our numbers aren't where we want them to be, because it'll cost you way more, you know, getting that bad hire. Than, so we're, we're really trying to keep our standards of where we want them as an organization. Uh, you've been here nine months, in, or eight months anyway. Has uh, there been any mention of the unsolved murders? There are three or four, four county units in the county of this area, just a few miles away. Uh, and is there any, how do you address, or do you address follow-up on those cold cases? I mean, I drive by Connecticut and Iron 12 times a day, and a, a lady was killed there 20-some years ago, and nothing ever happened. Right, and yeah, and I, so they caught me up to speed on something, they, you know, I had one of our captains just kind of, hey, we've got this one, we, and they told me the details of it, and there's some that, and two, sometimes you can, you've got evidence, and sometimes you wait for technology to catch up, you know? And I mean, it's happened a lot. And so we've got some cases where we think we know, you know, and we're like, man, if technology could get a little bit more advanced, we might be there to that case. And there's a couple of them that are like, man, just because of the collection, or even, you know, we went to the lab, and, you know, and they use up all the sample to test, there's that where, some of them may not get solved, just to be honest, but there's a couple I, I got briefed on that I, I think once the technology, because you know, DNA progresses all the time. And so I think, you know, we're going to get there at some point in time because we've got some, but you know, sometimes they want a bigger sample. And so hopefully once that, they can start getting more from that smaller sample. I, I think we're going to have, hopefully, evidence to go with the, the person that the, everything else is pointing to. So, try to make this quick. I know it's a subjective question. I know you don't have control over it. You'll ask the question about the police review board, and I think you said that it's relatively new to you and your experience. Uh, one of the criticisms by, from some about the creation of the new police review board, which was a change from the one that was there before, I hope I understand this correctly. I stand to be corrected that both the police chief and the sheriff are on the board. Do you have any thoughts if you were going to make any changes? Should you make changes? What are the advantages or disadvantages of having the chief and the sheriff on the board itself? It, so, you, yeah, so we're not on the board now. Oh, so you're not? No, we have an officer that's assigned to it. Okay. And so, or he's assigned, he volunteered, and so, and so he's there to kind of answer. Because, you know, they'll go into like a closed door because of the, the details and the, the, the people. Uh, yeah. And so, but yeah, I'm not on it right now. I go to them there to answer any questions, like when they have meetings. But I'm not actually on the board. To, like, to answer any questions or to yeah. sometimes like a, if you know if we don't have any cases for them to review we may go hey here's a new initiative we've got going to kind of keep them abreast of what's going on in the field. I appreciate that. Got to educate us. Yeah. <laughs> I have. Are you, are you as excited as I am about killing the farm I am very excited about <laughs> that. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. No. I, I'm You're SBI. <laughs> Oh, she asked if I was excited for the Killer of the Flower of the Moon. Yes, the, that, movie. Yeah, the movie. Oh yes, 
I'm very excited. You know, it's funny. So in our family, we still have um, the allotted land that was given to our family, and it's still we we got a family cemetery there, and it's out by Inner Darko. That's kind of where our tribe is located at. And so, yeah, it's uh, we're excited about that. And we've got a lot of friends that are Osage, and so I've heard these stories, you know, for a long time. And you know what's interesting is that happened at the same time that the Tulsa massacre happened, right. almost the same year, right. in that same. Uh, but anyway, I, yeah. So yeah, welcome that? to Kansas. Ooh, right. But I can't wait to see that. Man. Now you know, in talking about the Tulsa massacre, you know that's what's weird. My mom told me about it. But you never heard about it in school, exactly. you know. And then now it's coming out. But like I said, my mom told me all the time about it. And then, so even like, has this kind of what the last probably from 2020 on gained more traction? Even my wife, she's like, I never heard about it. I was like, I knew about it just because of my mom. I was like, school never mentioned a word about it. So, yeah, that's a pretty significant piece of history. Maybe you can have a discussion, do a discussion after that movie's in town. After the oh, I'd love to. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. yeah. So, I, I actually have one more to line up, pleasing question. And I know that SPD does not manage the jail, but uh, tell us your thoughts on the burden that is imposed by on people when they can't make bail and they just can't get out of jail and they get stuck. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Right. I mean, you know, yeah, that's the thing is like you don't ever want to create a debtor's prison, you know, and you know, yeah, you got money, people can bond out and then, but so, yeah, there's something that needs to be adjusted and fixed because, you know, just because of your financial status that you may set in jail up until the point, you know, and so, yeah, that's something, like I said, there's so much about the criminal justice system that we, as society, as lawmakers, we need to sit down and have a good talk about and go, what's the best idea? Because I, in a lot of times, there's probably someone that works in the, you know, the front line that they probably have the best ideas, you know, if we just sit and listen to them. So, but I think, yeah, there's something about that we got to get fixed. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. I want you to buy treats as you go out the door so it was worth Tammy's time to keep uh, keep Ad Astra open. It's normally closed on Mondays, so she did this for us. Um, Tammy has a broken foot, and so yeah, let's clap for Tammy. And for our All right, uh, Tammy has a broken foot, so she had to go home and elevate it. But um, I want to mention some upcoming events. The second Tuesday of this October and November are Lunch and Learns. Uh, October is Banned Books, a program from the library. Uh, the second, that's the second Tuesday of October. The second Tuesday of November is an update from Jane Anderson and Friends of the River to give us the latest on the river project. I also want to mention that uh, some Sunday night in October, which uh, is, someone is going to tell me, is the speed dating with the candidates. Uh, it's, it's October October 15th, Sunday afternoon at Sunrise Presbyterian Church. We're going to have uh, it's a it's a new method that we have learned of from Wichita League of Women Voters, and we have round tables and. Uh, there are, I think, 10 candidates, and we're going to have however many candidates there are, that's how many tables we'll have, and everybody sits around one of them, and the candidates will move from table to table. So you'll get 10 minutes with each candidate for the city commission and the school board, which is a little awkward for me to talk about here, uh, since we're not promoting any candidates. But anyway, um, so candidate speed dating, Sunday, October 15th, you say? Yes, 15th. Okay, so come out to all these other people. We're so happy all of you came, and thank you to Janet and David for giving me